Dr. Stephen Lieb is the renowned American economist and financial author. He has been following the silver market for decades. This is what he says. Let's talk about silver for a mini second here. Not only is silver money, because it has been for thousands yes. of years. I think longer um, than but, gold, but actually. It's also a commodity. And it has to be the most undervalued commodity on the planet. It, it, it is certainly, Andrew, it is so undervalued that uh, I, I've done work on silver and I've done the calculations. And, and here I, wor I worked pretty hard. I spent, I don't know, a week or a week and a half going through it and trying to realize how much uh, silver we would need to uh, uh, to create the amount of photovoltaics that we're going to need. Right now, uh, photovoltaics accounts for, I think, something like 1% or 2% of energy. It, it doesn't even account for a meaningful part of electricity. Once, you know, electricity becomes more widespread, I, I, you know, we are so short of silver just as an industrial commodity. It's unbelievable. And it's not surprising. Look at the qualities that silver has. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just repeating what I think people that know the metal. I mean, it's the best conductor. It's a much better conductor than copper. It's a bet, not just electrical conductor, but also thermal conductor. Now, you don't have to be a whiz bane chemist to realize if you're the best conductor of both energy and heat, there's going to be a lot of demand for you for, for this as a metal. And there is. And we wherever the wherever we can, we try and thrift silver. That was the word I was looking for before. We try and reduce the amount that we need, but up to a point, once you get to that point, you can't reduce it anymore. And once you get to that point and then try and scale up what you need, you're praying for a technological miracle. I mean, I have written in a, you know, my publication seriously about the possibility of having to go to the moon to mine helium-3. I mean, because we're just not going to have enough silver. We're not going to have enough of these very basic commodities. But if you tell me silver is the most undervalued econ uh, a commodity, and actually in a world that's growing, I mean, the problem with silver, if we're not growing, it can, you know, really punish you pretty quickly. Gold will not punish you to the extent silver will. But if you're growing and if you're on your way to, to, to achieving those goals, silver, I, I, I three figure cigar, silver, I hate, I don't want to sound like some sort of moonshot guy, sure. but it, it's, it's, it's cheap. It's cheap at three figures. It would be today at three figures. I mean, but again, I think it's suppressed. I mean, it's dramatically suppressed. I just have to mention one thing about gold and silver. If you ask a um, hundred economists or a hundred, let me put it this way, a hundred money managers, uh, like the head of BlackRock even, I mean, you know, these people that manage trillions of dollars, etc. What was the best performing asset in the first generation of the uh, 21st century. What was the best performing asset? What would you say? Well, I'll give you a hint. It wasn't any industrial commodity. It was not an industrial commodity. It was gold. Gold outperformed the S&P 500 with dividends included. Mm -hmm. And also, Andrew, to your point, despite all the volatility and the downward yeah. uh, pressure that we saw on economies and, you know, a couple of cases, uh, at the beginning of the century, we had a big bear market and in the middle of the century where, you know, commodities went down and silver went way down. Silver outperformed the S&P 500, dividends mm -hmm. included. Copper outperformed the S&P 500, dividends included. And even iron ore outperformed the S&P 500, dividends included. Now, I will challenge you. If you, I will bet you, uh, 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 I will bet you a, a, an ounce of gold. I'm not going to bet you paper money, but I'll bet you an ounce of gold that you cannot find any money manager in this country who will recommend any commodity in their portfolio, in a person's portfolio. It's still 60 40, 60% 60 stocks, 40% bonds, and no gold. Even though it outperformed, I mean, talk about, I, I picked the best financial asset, S&P 500. If you're talking about cash or you're talking about bonds, I mean, the difference between gold and um, uh, uh, um, financial assets is just enormous. You know, 
in this said that this next 20 years I, I fear what you're seeing right now is the 1970s, except on steroids, because the 1970s was basically a political issue where the Saudis basically boycotted oil. They wouldn't ship us any oil. That was a political problem. We don't have a political problem today. We have a fundamental economic scarcity problem, some of which is our own doing, as Fracking illustrates. But uh, this is not a problem we're going to get over very quickly without seeing commodity prices really, really skyrocket. And, uh, and, when, we, and when we value, if I could just say, when we look to value gold, because obviously that's something which <clears throat> we, we, our, our universe is gold and silver. So, and obviously all these other factors are a major, are major inputs. But, but when we try and come up to a value, you know, we've got clients that say to us who are very wealthy or sovereigns that we deal with even, and they say, well, okay, so wh where do you think? And when I'm posed the question is, well, where do you think the gold, the price of gold will be? And then we're also talking about, you, you mentioned dollar hegemony. And, and, and if you want to support dollar hegemony, uh, ultimately, you know, you, it relates to gold because ultimately the gold's collateralization of U.S. foreign obligation has now reached historic mm. lows. I mean, it's currently around 6%. And, and I think, you know, it, it, when it, the ratio has is always been around 20 to 40%. So, so if you actually apply those, those metrics to the price of gold, now you're looking at six to twelve thousand dollars per ounce. I mean, I'm not saying that's the price it should I be today, should but, be. <laughs> but, but yeah, exactly. So, and then if you go into 1980 levels, we were at a hundred and, if I remember right, 140 to one collateralization of, of, of debt to, to gold. So it was. I mean, that that should put gold at forty three thousand. You know, it's and, like you know, basically, I think what we're seeing here. Is is if if I mean dollar hegemony is is in, in, in on, a, on a slippery oh. slope. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information, and it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now let's continue. But I think the, the Bank of International Settlements has introduced Basel III, uh, and um, I think. It's because they see that gold must be revalued. They see Russia, China, and the people you're just talking about, the BRICS countries, all the people who value, uh, who, who, who want to back currencies with gold, realize that, that a higher gold price is actually going to assist them, it, it's, whereas the Fed it's, is it's the completely whole, out to it's, lunch. It, Andrew, I mean, thank you for that 6% figure. I'm going to use it. <laughs> I didn't realize... I mean, I, I've talked about valuing gold in lots of different ways, and I, I do come up with very high numbers, well into five figures, potentially. I mean, I think once gold, and you're absolutely right, gold is never mentioned by a central bank. It's never mentioned by our Fed. But you know who else never mentions gold in any of their conversation about reserve currencies? is China. You have to infer they're talking about gold because they're scared to mention it. They don't want to. They don't want to see gold. I mean, my guess is, it's just a guess, is that the first stop for gold, maybe now, I mean, I think we're very close to a point of inflection, but I think the first stop will be around 5,000. And we may just keep going from there as the world needs more gold because you're going to the scarcer commodities get, the higher your reserve currency is going to have to be in order to allocate those commodities in an effective way. I mean, this whole government of the world is going to have to change, but it doesn't have to affect the sovereignty of countries. And that's what I think we have to recognize. America can get back to its basic freedoms, which we have escaped. I mean, we're, we're, we're not nearly as free as people conceive of us as being. What would you suggest the average person should consider doing to protect themselves right if now? If I could say one thing, I mean, it can't really be average. Well, yes, it can be. I'm sorry, no. Great question. Buy precious metals, buy the physical stuff. And I'm thinking right. even people that are, are poor in, in the United States can still buy silver coins. You don't have to spend a lot of money. I mean, if you buy a, a, a Kruger Rand, you usually have to spend an, an ounce of gold, whatever that is. It's 
uh, well, it's higher today than it yes. was yesterday, but it's over 1,900 U.S. dollars. Uh, um, that might be too much, but you can buy silver coins, and you can, you know, instead of instead of dollar averaging in the stock market, dollar average, or you may have to average up in silver or gold or both. That would be one thing to protect yourself, and that's what I advise. I always carry around, Stephen. I always carry around one of your beautiful uh, silver eagles. This one is 1902. And what I say, the reason I carry it around, as I say to people, they, I talk about silver, they go, oh, what, what's, uh, yeah, silver. No, this will buy you, this single dollar will buy you 30 times more than it did in 1902. What more can you say? Uh, that, that makes the case. And now that you're facing a world in which commodities are becoming scarce for the first time uh, um, ever in, in, in civilization's history, and the reason is it's the first time ever that 85% of the world is growing. In fact, they're, they're defining growth. The middle income countries are much larger now. They crossed the high income countries back in 2015, and now they're much larger. And I would guess in 2021, the demand for commodities probably reached the greatest ever because of the you know big boost to the world's economy. Well, that meant middle income countries. And they're the ones that are really demanding commodities. They need them for growth. We don't need as many commodities. They're essential and they're critical. And without them, we'll starve. But it's the middle income countries that are driving this demand. And for the first time in our history, the middle income countries are not only larger than the high income countries, <clears throat> but growing much faster. And that's why this is a problem that is likely to get worse and worse until it gets better, if it gets better. And I'm praying, literally praying, that, that it will work out. So yes, I, the one bit of advice, gold and silver and physical. Small ebook, big impact, the wealth tree, the only four ways that will make you financially free forever. Download it here for free.